Hi, and welcome to Season 4 of Beyond Teaching, brought to you by the Psych Sessions Network. This series is hosted by Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University, Adyinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York, City University of New York, Asani Sewell from LGS Legacy Weight Diabetes Institute, and yours truly, Eric Landrum from Boise State University. For now, the Psych Sessions podcast, Beyond Teaching, is all about the teaching, research, and clinical skills that psychological scientists need to know about to be successful. You know, all the survival skills needed to thrive in the academic or clinical workspace beyond your formal graduate school training, all the stuff that we were never taught while we were in the graduate school classroom. For season four, we have 12 episodes in store for you with a weekly release starting July 2022 and delightfully stretching into October 2022, helping you make that transition from summer to fall, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, that is, whether you are on the semester system or the quarter system. What's in store? We'll discuss the importance of staying up to date, helping students with personal statements and spark birds, student researchers, what a unionized campus looks like, a peek at the life of adjuncts, adjunct faculty from two different perspectives, interacting with the media, uh-oh, cleaning out your office, and it might not be one of the four of us you thought it would be, <laughs> saying yes or no, and Maria Banford's advice about that topic, ascension and doctoral versatility, dealing with professorial conflicts, and taking tenure out for a spin and career sustainability in the face of the great resignation, or what you might call the big quit. In season four, we also had guests join us for three of the 12 episodes. I'm not going to tell you who or which episodes. That way you'll be curious and you'll want to listen in in order to satisfy that natural curiosity that you have. So there. Please enjoy season four of Beyond Teaching. Welcome back. If I'm keeping track on my abacus, I believe this is going to be season four. What? 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 <laughs> hey, Yanko, welcome to the show. This is season four. I'm so Who thrilled. started this? I know. I know. It's the magic of numbering any way we want to. It's not <laughs> year four. It's season either. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you sneak in a super special season two during Thanksgiving week 2021. Mm -hmm. I'm so thrilled to be here. I am Eric Landrum from Boise State University. I'm a Sonny Oh, go ahead, Yinka. We're out of practice. We are. I'm just a little punchy. Punchy, <laughs> punchy. What's the word? Yinka Kinchalura Smith from the City College of New York. Sonny Sewell Pacific University. And I'm Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University. And maybe Yinka can explain why she's a bit punchy, because it's kind of the foundation of what we want to talk about in today's episode. So I have been attending a two-day training. This was just day one, 9 to 5, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. times two, tomorrow two, on narrative exposure therapy. And it, it's a type of... Uh, therapeutic intervention that's used to help process trauma. It's been written up, lots of research supporting this approach. It's a short-term intervention that's been used globally for many populations in many languages around the world. Including in refugee camps, right? I've, Including I've in refugee yeah. camps. Yes, yes, yes. So you can, it, after, after you're finished with these nine to four, 18 hours, will you... Now, are you getting trained to be able to administer, can I say NET or NET? Mm -hmm. um, will you be trained to teach it? Will you be trained to administer it? What will be your training qualification? And, and Eric, can I just jump in before Yinka answers? Because what I want to tell our audience. Apparently, is yes. <laughs> yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> so we roll. I'm good enough friends with y'all to know, because I want to put it in a, a larger context for our audience that what we want to talk about today is the idea of, of we go to these trainings for different things, whether it's therapy or teaching or other aspects of our uh, stats training, how do we then bring it back to our professional life? So that's our overarching topic is that. 
Yeah. So, I mean, just to kind of respond to both your questions, this is a an intervention that's been around for a while and I've known of and I've used elements of, but really wanted to learn how to do it properly. And so that was the push. The plan is for me to be able to use it with my clients, but also, you know, I teach trauma courses. So I also want to be able to take what I have learned and bring it to my students. So they, you know, I'm not going to train them in doing it in our you know, in our short classroom periods, but so that they understand what it's about, how it works, what's the theoretical, you know, perspective behind it, what populations it can be used with and so on. And and Yanka, forgive me if I oversimplify this because I do not live in a clinician's world. Will you add this as part of your toolkit, as part of your repertoire of, of tools that you might use to help someone in a trauma situation? Most definitely. And, and will, at the end of the training, will you receive any certificate or training verification that you've gone through it? Will there be some sort of documentation? They better. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. No, yeah. no, no, no. And that's, you know, and again, yes, absolutely. And for me also, you know, as a clinician, you know, you always want to be updating your skill set. Right. And, and again, not only updating it for me, for my clients, but also for my students. So, so they get exposed to the range of tools that are out there for us to use as clinicians. And the, you know, it's, it's, it's an evidence-based intervention that's just got tons of supporting research. And I don't know what the laws are in the state of New York, but I, I assume these are CEUs for you? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here, here's my larger point. And Thank you all for being patient with me. You were working up to something, Eric, but I was just trying to, I'm like, I'm just going to stay quiet and watch this thing on. I know this was an interrogation. Where is this going? Oh, first of all, I didn't mean for it to be an interrogation. I really didn't. But here's where I was headed with this. She does have an alibi. (laughs) In the room, behind the closet, under the red feather. I don't know. Isn't there a game with that? a feather? (laughs) Okay. I don't know. Is there a feather? I don't know. Shouldn't. Teachers of psychology have to do the exact same thing. Shouldn't there be CEUs? Shouldn't there be an ethical requirement that teachers of psychology be up to date on the professional standards of teaching? And I don't care if it's called CEUs or whatnot, but the helping of clients in pain and tragedy is incredibly important. But isn't the education of oh, I don't know, 46 million college students in the United States a year and making sure that, that we're using evidence-based instructional practices? Just a thought. I completely agree. I completely agree. And I think a lot of us in the teaching world do trainings that relate to teaching. And I think, you know, we have a nice mix here with Yinka and Asani having a, a clinical part of their job. I'd like to hear how, any of us choose what trainings to attend because we could attend trainings every single day of the year. There's so much to learn. Mm. Like Yinka, how did you, how did you pick this? You know, I tend to lean towards trainings that are clinical. So, and that I'm going to be able to use primarily with my patients, my clients, but because I teach in the masters of mental health counseling and I teach trauma, I want to be able to go back and also give my students state of the art, if you will, information. So I'm not going to sit with them for how, what, 18 hours and and do any tea, but I I want to be able to be well enough versed in it that I can teach them about it. I can teach them the basics. I can give them an understanding of what it entails, who not to use it with, who they should use it with and and what they, you know, and, and how to critique it. How about you, Asani? Yeah, I I agree with that. I think, you know, certainly I'm sure New York State is the same way, but here in Oregon, of course, we've got a certain number of continuing education requirements we have to complete within a two-year period. And within those, you've got to do a certain number of certain kinds of things, cultural competency, ethics. There's some different areas like that. And so I will look for trainings that can kind of fit into those categories, but also resonate with the work that I'm doing, just like Inka was just sort of describing. You know, I I think I also look for sort of known entities, like, Mm -hmm. you know, professionals in the field that I sort of trust and not like, 
whoever, whoever person, <laughs> you know, something that's going to be really sort of meaningful for the time that I'm going to be taking. But yeah, I agree. Similar to Yinka, I'm looking for things that are going to enhance the work that I'm doing with my clients, with my students and expose me potentially to a new skill set too. That's, mm-hmm. that's really important. So I think we actually, you know, listening to Yinka and Asani, I think we have a model of this for teaching as well. We have a lot of conferences that have workshops at the beginning of them. And I know the Association for Psychological Science has had teaching workshops, the International Convention on Psychological Science, which is APS's international version, has that. SDP, the Society for Teaching of Psychology's annual conference on teaching, has had pre-conference workshops, whether or not on research, like scholarship of teaching and learning. I actually had the opportunity to do a certificate in summer 2020 uh, when I was just desperate to learn how to be able to teach in a pandemic online. SDP, the Society for Teaching of Psychology, was co-sponsoring something by the UN, United Nations mandated University for Peace based in Costa Rica, but it was virtual and it was on global citizenship education. And I was teaching an international psychology class. So just like Yinka and Asani were saying, like this was something that was relevant for some of the scholarship that I do, but it was also very relevant in the classroom. And I think choosing a training that that maps onto both. And now I've been completely sucked in and I'm going to do their diploma program during my sabbatical next year. Ooh, <laughs> that's awesome. Look into that. I did Very cool. That. Are you going on sabbatical next year? Well, I'm pretending I am. I haven't gotten approval. So by the time this airs, I... <laughs> you too. <laughs> you too? <laughs> Sorry, I'm sidelined. I... You know, Eric, when you my sabbatical? Within an hour, I had submitted my application. I'm tired. I need a break. Mm-hmm. I'm due. I'm due. I'm out overdue. I'm overdue by a year. But we have a really friendly department where we work it out so that we can all get our sabbaticals. That's great. How about you, Eric? How do you choose? About Somebody which needs to keep the trains running. So I'm not <laughs> going on sabbatical. How, how do you choose what trainings to attend? So I, Susan, that's a great question. And I promise I'll come back to it eventually. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> Maybe you will. <laughs> no, I, I, I really will. It is a good question. You dodging this. No, no, I just wanted to say something else first. I think, I think higher ed is the one weird place where trainings are not consistent. Trainings are not, they're not vetted very well. I think even in the CEU world, there is some standard by which you must apply. And CEUs are governed by some agency. Even in the K-12 space, there are CEU responsibilities for K-12 teachers to have so many CEUs per year. Uh, And Susan's exactly right about ICPS and APS and APA can provide some CEUs. I know some of the regionals, I'll bet EPA does this. I know Rocky Mountain Psychological Association started offering some sessions with CEUs for people who need it in our region. But, But the quality of things that come out of some regionals and even some of the national conventions is so variable. I'm not quite sure it would be good for CEUs. So I think there's some work that actually could be improved upon there. How do I choose? Wow. That is, that is such a good question. I'm really going to, I'm going to answer it for real. I tend to choose by the people who are presenting and maybe that's not a very good answer. It's my honest answer because I want to go hear a Yinka or an Asani or a Susan, because I know it's going to be a top quality presentation of the most up-to-date stuff, as opposed to maybe it's somebody I've never heard of and that it might be great or it might not be. So I, I know there's some problems with that approach, but if I'm going to go to a conference, I just don't want to waste my time because that time is precious. And I will tell you, as a person nearing, you know, towards the twilight of his career, a lot of times conferences are more social events. They're more networking events. And I have found myself at conferences being more of a teacher than a learner, although I still have a lot to learn. So I I think that that actually is a good answer. And Asani was saying something similar when she was, Mm -hmm. I think you were talking about the person in the organization. And it's similar for me. In fact, um, Kelly Haynes Mendez, who was the former vice president of diversity and international relations for STP and is now the current director of the Office of Ethnic Minority Affairs at EPA and is a a good friend of mine, had done some of the certificates at the University for Peace. And it was her 
endorsements in particular of the people who are running the workshop that I did that I didn't know them personally, but it was Kelly's endorsement. Yep. And so I think it's the same thing. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that. Well, it just means that I may not widen my scope of knowledge by being so insular. And I, I know the limitations, but like, yeah. So like if Kelly was recommending, you're right. Like the friend of a friend is my friend kind of thing. Absolutely. But, you know, and sometimes, you know, I've walked into things at APS and just because I was killing time in between sessions and sometimes they were incredibly good. It was like, how come I've never heard of this person after 30 years? And sometimes I've walked in and I went, now I know why I've never heard of this person after 30 years, you know? And they were both keynote speakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because you're invited keynote doesn't mean that you're much of a speaker. I, I have a funny story. I paid for a statistical workshop because I've gone to statistics workshops over the years to try to build my skills given how things are changing and when I got my PhD. I was somebody very well known, actually not a psychologist from another field, but at a psychology conference, another behavioral science field. I will not say who it is, but somebody whose work I, I admired and had done some writing in a number of venues that I'd been able to read. And I was just super excited. And after about, and I remember, I can't remember which conference it was, but it was in Chicago. And after about an hour, I was so turned off by the sort of paternalizing, paternalistic, condescending, obnoxious presentation. And I was like, I'm not learning anything. And this is the last day of the conference. And I wonder what it would cost me to switch my flight earlier and just get the heck out of here now <laughs> instead of being here for five hours. And it turned out it was like 30 more dollars to fly out earlier. And I redeemed my flight, got on the L, went to O'Hare and went home. So, I mean, and this was somebody whose writing is awesome. You know, the, the, the thing though that I, I, I that's one of the, the things that I've loved about sitting and, and talking with all of you and doing this podcast is just how much I learn from all of you. So there are some things that just in terms of talking about training and so on and, and conferences and places to go that I didn't, I didn't know about. Nobody, nobody told me. Like, I didn't know about the society, the STP. I did not. I didn't know about Encore. I didn't know about the University of Peace. So this is all like, so I've been, I've been scribbling. Well, you've got a list over now. there, Yinka. <laughs> yes, because my plan is to make space and time and do some of this and go and go to these conferences and have some more time for reconnecting. You know, I mean, the learning piece is good too, but then also to go back to what Eric was saying, the, the, the social component, building networks, you know, expanding that the, 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 that list those 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 that list of colleagues yeah plus can i can, can i just reiterate something that susan said and and i think it's worth actually tuning into it's okay to walk out if your time is being wasted in mm -hmm. all seriousness if your time is being wasted your everyone's time is valuable and maybe just a, a walk around the city of chicago or getting home early or or finding a quiet space to read a book or check your phone. Your time is valuable. Don't sit in a session and suffer through someone else's lack of preparation or inability to communicate. It's okay to walk out, even if you've paid for it, especially if you've paid for it. Yeah. Thanks for saying that, Eric, for giving yeah. that permission. I think that that's so important. You know, I think that sometimes with these trainings and conferences too, the schedule can be so grueling. And you traveled across the country and it starts early in the morning and goes into late in the evening and you're trying to keep up with it. And it can be hard sometimes. Sometimes you feel like I really could use a break, just like a few, an hour or something to myself to just refresh and then I could get back into this. And sometimes you just need the permission to be able to just do exactly what you're talking about. And I do think it's okay and it's important. The self-care piece is important, I think, with this. For sure. Agree, Asani. Yeah. 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 Even if your department is paid for it and you feel like, oh, I'm letting my department down, you're really not. Because if you're cranky if, after sitting there, you know you're not going to get anything out of it and you grab the handouts, j just just take mm -hmm. off. And here's one more thing kind of related. I'm pretty sure Susan will agree with me on this one. If, if you can afford the self-care, spend the money on yourself for the self-care, meaning 
if you can afford the quiet time in the airport lounge of the choice of your of your flyer of United or Delta or American, if you have the ability to upgrade to that, if you have the, the privilege to do that, or if you can bump into economy plus or first class, give yourself the comfort and convenience if that is aligned with your lifestyle. Because arriving home a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more rested means the next day is going to be a little bit easier for you. Or the, the first conference day arriving there is going to be a little bit easier for you. I realize I have the privilege oftentimes to do that and others don't. So I want to acknowledge that. But those little creature comforts can be big creature comforts. Absolutely. And sometimes it's not as expensive as people think. If you check the day of a flight and first, you know, well, it's, I call it fake first class in the U.S. because they're just like, you know, it's not like lie down or anything. And sometimes people don't want to pay for that. And sometimes when you check in and if it's a long flight, sometimes it's like 50, 60 bucks to do the upgrade last, last minute because no one wants it. And, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I'll scrimp to, you know, be able to be comfortable on a long flight. Um, and I know 50, 60 bucks can be a lot for many, many people, but sometimes I think people think it's like thousands of dollars for the upgrade and it's not always. That's so great. I think, oh, I was going to say, if we could go around one last time with like a final thought about choosing trainings, using trainings, walking out of trainings. <laughs> and I had paid for that one myself. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I was just going to mention, I've never done this before, but I've always thought that I should, that it would be nice after a training, if I had like a buffer day before I got into my usual routine, just a moment of reflection to sort of think about, okay, where am I going to input this information or what classes are going to go into or, or, or what have you? I mean, what happens so frequently for me is that I am in a phenomenal training. I get back to my work and I'm sort of in the groove and the rhythm of work. And then I never managed to bring in that great knowledge from the conference into what I'm doing. So I, yeah. having a little bit more time to just sort of reflect and figure out where am I going to put this? Where does this fit? It's a great point. Yeah. For me, I think choosing trainings that help me in more than one way, like the stuff from University for Peace helps my classes very directly, helps the scholarship that I do. And honestly, the next thing that I'm doing involves gross global happiness, which is a like a, a way of assessing how countries are doing and how to be happier. And from a evidence-based perspective, that's the next what I'm doing. And that's going to help me in my own personal life, but it's also going to directly affect my classes because I teach positive psychology segments in my international psychology class, my abnormal psychology class, which by the way, Seton Hall just voted to call mental health and my introduction to psychology class. And I can even pull in, if I teach statistics, I can even pull in those studies. So I think choosing trainings that help you in more than one way is like a double or a triple dip. Yeah, definitely. Yinka or Eric, final thoughts? You know, I, I, I really, with both, with what both you and Asani have said, just having a little time to breathe and reflect afterwards, as opposed to keep on chugging along. And, you know, having a, a choosing, choosing a training that's, that's, that's good, that's relevant, and that can hit multiple points. It has always been key for me in, 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 in you know, I'm thinking to, to the ones that I've done recently, and I've been on a bit of a roll recently, but they've all been things that work both clinically and in the classroom. That's great. I guess for me, you know, Coming out of the pandemic, I have to tell you, I'm a lot less interested in traveling to conferences and trainings than I was pre-pandemic. I traveled a lot prior to the pandemic and, and got a lot of joy out of that and seeing my friends and going to conferences and listening to talks and giving talks occasionally and kind of adjusted and adapted during the pandemic. And the things that I'll attend in 2022 are more of a personal support of people than the training aspect. Going to WPA to support the president in 2022, going to RPA to support, support that president, going to EPA because of an invitation from that president. So it, for me, it's become more of personal connections and not as much of a training connection. 
so to speak. So that's my odd spot that I'm in. Thanks, everyone. This was a really fun conversation.